listen, you are India's youngest billionaire, right? Yeah. A you are. How, how many billions is it? Do you have this? Is it one billion? Is it two billion? Is it 10? What's the, what's the count on billions right now? Um, well, uh, Jordan, it's how you value startups in our ecosystem is a multiple of the profits we make. So that comes up to a fairly exaggerated number. Uh, for all practical, pragmatic terms, I don't think the billionaire tag is, uh, you know, it really doesn't uh, mean that I have billions of dollars. Sure, I understand. So in other words, what you're saying is the overall at long-term asset value is over a billion dollars if you extrapolated the cash flows. But uh, in terms of uh, today's prices, it doesn't really matter whether you're a billionaire or not. You're fucking rich and you're young and you started with nothing, right? You started with literally working for $10 a month, was it, and a call center? Yeah, I think like $100, yeah. $100 yeah. a month. <laughs> okay, yeah. that sounds a bit, a bit more reasonable. So $100 a month. And how old were you then? At 18 years old, you were working at a call center? About 17. 17. Yeah. Just first, let's very quickly, let's do a big overview here, broad overview of how you go from making $10 and uh, $100 a month to being one of the richest young people in India. How does that happen in, 10, in 12 years or so? Let's go through the process. How does it go down? Yeah, so it's been about 17 years. I'm 34 today. Uh, uh, back when I used to work in a call center, when I began, I was 17. Uh, a lot of getting lucky, being in the right time at the right place. Uh, the one constant throughout this journey has been the stock market. Uh, I started trading when I uh, started working at a call center. And trading has really done well and has led to broking and asset management and everything else that we do today. So what, what you thought started trading for your own account when you were 17 years old? Yeah. One of the, the most famous money managers in all of India, his name is Mati, right? You know him? Very famous guy. He ran Reliance's uh, portfolio for many years. Very, He's known as like the, as the 10-bagger guy or the multi-bagger man or something in India. Do you know him? No, I, I do not know him. There are quite a few. Like, yeah, you would be surprised. It's like a large market. You know, I've had a relationship with him for a while. And what he said to me is that in India, it's very important that when you invest in companies, you also have an active eye on watching the management because there's a lot of mismanagement in these companies. So it's not just about investing blindly in companies. It's also really being careful that the management is doing the right thing, the right people are in place. Is that true? Yeah, I would say it was more true back in the day, uh, but compliance and regulation has caught up to a great degree. And especially if you're buying large cap companies in India today, uh, you don't have to worry too much about management and governance per se. Did you make your money by starting, is it a hedge fund deal? Is that where you made your money? So you, you were able to get other people to give you money and then you made money on that money and that's how you got rich? No, we, we did very well on broking. We started a broking company about 11 years ago, uh, much like you have Robin Hood in America. Okay. Uh, so we started that in India about 11 years ago, discount broker, uh, simplified the ecosystem and that company has scaled a lot. So it's the largest uh, broker in India today. How many uh, users do you have on the platform? We're about 5 million. 5 million, wow, that's a lot of users. You have 5 million users and is it mostly investing in Indian stocks or stocks from all over the world? Mostly Indian stocks. Uh, so the one common thing you will notice about Southeast Asian economies here is we all have capital controls. Uh, a citizen of India is only allowed to invest about 250,000 US dollars a year outside of India. Uh, and when it comes to assets under management, the large pools typically belong to, you know, the ultra HNI clientele, and they can't themselves invest more than 250k a year abroad. That doesn't apply, though, to some of the really, you know, massive families in India. Like, for example, you have a company, um, you know, one of the big families owns steel, a large steel company that's sort of a international conglomerate, right? Uh, it applies to everybody as an individual. Uh, if me as an individual wants to invest in America today, I can't do more than 250K a year. But what many Indians typically do is, you know, they have a family of four or five. So that 250K becomes a million dollars. 
Now, as a company, when you're investing, you can go to the central bank here. We call them the Reserve Bank of India. You take permission. Uh, we have something called ODI. It's a route or a vehicle in which you can invest uh, money abroad, but it's corporate I money, see. not personal. I got it. So you form a corporation, basically, and yeah. through your company, yeah. you can make investments abroad and stuff like that. Is that a very common thing in India that wealthy people do? Uh, yeah, yeah. There are some regulations around it. You can't just form a company today. You will have to be, you know, in a regulated sector for a certain amount of time before ODI is approved and stuff like that. But the large ticket investments you're talking about are probably done through the ODI route. Got it. Now, um, about, I think it was going to be five or six years ago, your mm -hmm. country went through a complete demonetization, correct? Yeah. So tell me how that worked. So I think the, the issue with India was that it was very much a cash economy where people kept their money outside the traditional banking system in their mattresses. Lots of things were done with bribery and a lot of graft involved. So the president, a very smart guy, is it Moti, I think, or Modi? Yeah, yeah, the prime right? minister. He, the yeah, prime, prime minister, right? He actually recalled all the money and essentially if you didn't turn your money back in for new money your money became worthless right yeah yeah so tell uh, me about that process and how that impacted the economy what was that like going through that sure so the issue began uh, much earlier uh, in the 70s and 80s there there used to be a point of time when the tax rates in india had gone up to as high as 90 percent we were in some form of uh, civil emergency at that point what happens when you tax people of the country at 90%? Nobody wants to formally declare any income. That kind of seeded the alternative uh, gray sector or the black money economy in the country. And I think in many ways, those patterns that we created then have continued to exist up until today. Uh, so Modi, when he came into power very early, uh, so we have two large parties here in India. Uh, one is called the BJP to which uh, Modi belongs. The other is the Congress. The Congress was ruling up until 2014 uh, when BJP came to power. This was one of the first things he did. Uh, very hard to weigh in on that and figure if it worked well for us, but it did not. Uh, almost about 98, 99% of the money came back into the system. Uh, so, by that, do you come to the conclusion that we only have 1% or 2% of our economy in cash? The black economy? Probably not. I think people found ways and means of figuring out how to convert their black money into uh, legally tax-paid money. But uh, I, I think we're still, we're still kind of like facing the long-term repercussions of what was done then. Uh, we have seen many forms of economic slowdown on the ground ever since demonetization happened. Uh, I don't know if it achieved all that it was trying to achieve. There are a lot of critics of it who say it was not executed in the manner that it could have been executed. At. I think the idea was that um, they gave an amnesty to people that if you, if you brought your money back into the system within a certain period of time, then you would not be uh, looked at or, or thrown into jail for not declaring taxes. Was that the story pretty much? Yeah, so they did allow for people to come in and file back taxes before they, all, before they announced demonetization. Uh, there was no paying back taxes once demon was announced, but people still found alternate ways of converting their black money into white. 